So my name is Santi and I'm a PG student here with the speech processing research group and I've been doing deep learning for three years now, especially for speech processing applications, but more I've been opening to more general multimedia stuff for like more than one year and a half, I think. So first, uh, I'm in charge to introduce you to generative modeling. And this is what this topic of today is about and next day. So there will be two hours of deep generative model. So not any sort of generative model, which is a technique in machine learning, but deep generative models, which are specific for deep learning. So the, outli the outline will be for the two days, opening an introduction of what are generative models and why do we want them, and then the taxonomy of the types of generative models that we can encounter. So uh, then we'll move into the three most famous ones nowadays and which are outperforming the generative model tasks uh, with deep techniques. So first there's this Pixel CNN and WaveNet, which is basically the current Google Assistant speech synthesizer now. So it's the very, very state-of-the-art uh, generative model for speech synthesis there. Then variation out encoders that uh, Chavi introduced somehow and that I'll explain here, which are like, you can see them as a sort of an evolution over the autoencoders themselves. And then generative adversarial networks, which are like the holy grail nowadays of generative modeling in deep learning. So many, many things appearing nowadays in this generative stuff are generative adversarial networks. Uh, and then some application examples and model comparisons. So first we'll review up to this point today, and then next day we'll have this last uh, three points, let's say. So let's begin with uh, w what we are used to, or you are used to now, with probably with networks. So far what you've seen is what's called discriminative modeling. So uh, apart from saying we can have supervised learning, unsupervised learning, or reinforcement learning, that's the way you deal with data and labels, you can model the data by uh, either making the network discriminate something, the label, from the input data you give, for instance, the image, or to take care of how was the data generated. So that's the difference between a discriminative model that's saying this is this label given this input image of the unrolled pixels, or we can make it say, okay, I have a bunch of data in a data set, images, books, so text, or waveforms saying whatever, and we want our model to basically mimic this underlying generator that is bringing the waveforms, the pictures, or the text. So basically, we want the model to replicate the distribution of the generation process, okay? So P of X, rather than saying, I want some discrimination of some label given the input X, I want to know how X was generated, and I want to mimic that, such that once I've learned enough from data, in this case, unsupervised data, because I just don't have any label, I could have bunches of images in my model. It's like learning from it, whatever it has to learn, or however it has to learn to be a generative model. It's just reading the images. And then it's composing this distribution such that then I can sample new images from that. Which means it's not memorizing, it's learning how to generate new stuff, similar to what it has seen, okay? Is there anyone here that has seen generative models ever? Yeah? Okay. Deep generative models? Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, so, actually, if we have labels, we can also play around with not modeling, just the discrimination of this is history book or a sci-fi book by giving it the text and saying, what is this book about? But it can, we can say, model the, this both this book is a history book, this one is a sci-fi book, and then in the inference time I can choose what I want to generate, so a specific subset of the full distribution P, joint distribution X and Y, I can say for these Ys generate X content. So I could be forcing to generate the subset of history books or sci-fi books by modeling both data with labels. So this is uh, either with unlabeled data or with labeled data to have a more specific application of our interest. So as a quick example of uh, quite simple um, 
modeling technique for if we have 1D data that's basically following a Gaussian distribution are these green dots that basically concentrate more here in this origin. So this is similar to what Xavi has shown before. If I have this bunch of dots and uh, I can have a generative model that's like parametrized in this, in this case, I could say my model is learning the mean and the standard deviation that's mimicking the points uh, density. So I could get to have some learning algorithm that's adjusting those parameters to, to basically make that my model, which is, has a distribution P model, so the outputs that I'm drawing from my model, follow P model distribution that's mimicking Gaussian here. But, okay, this is rather simple. What if I tell you I want to actually generate images, so photos. I want to generate even HD photos nowadays, okay? So that maybe I have faces of people that don't exist, but maybe from a bunch of examples of many faces from many people, I can get new faces that do not exist, but are realistic. So they follow, as Xavi said, the distribution of something known in the nature. In this case, I could have training examples and I have butterflies and mushrooms and coffee. So out of this uh, huge data of the amount of images, they have a natural distribution. It's not just random pixels. My model has to learn to mimic that such that it can generate now, image, now new images that don't exist. So this dog shouldn't be in the data set, nor this person swimming, nor anything else. But it's just a made-up thing because it knows how the world is, um, looks like somehow. And it's like us that maybe we have seen many rabbits and then we learn to draw the rabbits afterwards. So somehow we want the model to learn to draw. So uh, why do we want these generative models? Um, there's a lot of research, uh, mainly because uh, they are very interesting to first understand the world which works with very high dimensional data, like images. So if you get to understand the, gener the underlying generation process, uh, you can get to have some, let's say, common sense of how the world is made, either from the audio generating process, the image generating process. You can learn how the physics of the world works by modeling the distribution of behaviors in that world. After that, you will get that your generator can make uh, some new scenarios which are virtual but look realistic for a discriminator model to be more strong such that you don't have to keep generating more and more data and label it, but maybe you can get to have a fair enough generative model, let's say, that can generate new hypothetical situations that look realistic enough for a discriminator model to learn from it. So that's, for example, a scenario where generative models are not only to generate pictures and synthesize speech and give us these applications, uh, which are very useful, but also to strengthen other models, in this case, uh, discriminative ones, for example. Um, then some motivation, motivating applications to end with this introduction could be, for example, imaging painting, where we have some image with, which has some artifacts from the past of the time or whatever, and we want to reconstruct it or enhance it somehow. So if our model learns what the natural distribution of the image is, we can give it a spoiled image and then it can recover a good version of it by not only changing color or whatever, because it thinks it's more adjusted, to the naturalness of the image, but it can reconstruct deleted parts. And that's a very interesting part for the, this is what common sense stands for. So we know what would be there, although there is a cluttering in this case. So the genetic model learns to regenerate stuff like we would do. Then for a speech, the same applies. I can have noise or destroyed parts from the speech and this gets recovered. So this is called speech enhancement. Then we can have synthesis like Siri or other uh, assistants where they generate this natural speech out of text or out of just speech. So it's not just about conditioning on I have a text and I want to generate it saying something, but it can just learn how natural speech sounds. So we will see afterwards an example of the WaveNet when we do not condition. We can hear it is natural speech but saying nonsense and then we can condition to say good, like normal things with language. And then image generation is another case. Here we can say, generate me some samples and it would generate random images, or we could say, generate me images of dogs or whatever. Uh, and 
Finally, super resolution is this application where an original image has been decimated, and then if I want to reconstruct it, I would probably get a really, really blurred version of it. So a generative model can just make it sharpie again by predicting a plausible, a plausible solution for that. It's not just it's not just averaging neighborhoods of pixels and getting, as Xavi said, uh, an average of possibilities at every place in the image when we reconstruct. That's the normal naive approach to make interpolation. But in this case, at every point, the generative model is saying, these are my neighbor of pixels, and I know the distribution I would have here. So I draw a random sample from this distribution, but it is a plausible distribution. If it learned it good enough, we will have the details of the original image, or not those details, but ones that could replace those in the original image, OK? Plausible details, not exactly the same ones. But this is a random process. The only thing is that we're learning the plausible random process. So every sample we sample has to be realistic. That's the point. So the taxonomy that we will see in these generative models uh, here are basically three types. So we are modeling these probability distributions. And we can do it, so probability density functions, let's say. And we want to model it either explicitly or implicitly. Explicitly would be we have a tractable density and a decomposition, a mathematical decomposition of it. So we know how the distribution is. And we model it like that. Or with an approximate density that we will see what it means, which is not the real density, but something that's close enough to generate the, <coughs> the good quality samples. Sorry. And then the implicit distribution is something that we're not directly modeling. It's just learning implicitly a distribution. So it's learning a distribution, but we do not know how. We're just giving it some, let's say, mirroring effect that, that we see cause of it learning, sorry, we know the effect of it learning that distribution, but we are not the cause why it is learning that. That's generative adversarial networks. And you'll see that both the two networks alone can make this learning process of a distribution without us knowing at all how that distribution is. Whereas here we know how these distributions are. And we are basically building, coding the model to be like those distributions. You'll see this difference. So these are um, we'll see in the end, not today, but the comparison among these three methods. So I'll begin with these two. And you'll have a lab for the third one, which are like quite hot nowadays. Um, so first, PixRNN, PixelCNN, and WaveNet, which are three terms that specify the same. It is, uh, it's the first type of model. It's explicit with tractable density. So how can we model P of x? We know that we have a generation process, and maybe we have images. And images are these grids of pixels. That's basically our sample x, a grid of pixels. Let's say it's just one channel, so grayscale image. We have this 0, 1, 2. And then if we have this length n, we would have this n here, n to n, and so on. Okay. So what we would do is we can enroll this, and we would get our vector from 0, 1, 2 to n square. This is how it would be. But we want to model something that, that, that we want a generator of these huge dimensional vectors. Imagine this image is not 20 times 20, but I don't know, 100 times 100. It's a million pixels. So uh, they can grow really quickly. And the thing is, um, but the thing is, even with that, even with that, uh, growth in the dimensionality, what we can do is play with the basic chain rule of probability and say, if we have the full chain of dimensions, because these are every pixel position is a dimension, we can just decompose it, factorize it with the chain rule of probability, which stands for predicting the current item given all the previous ones. It's just a sequential process where the final resolution of all my pixels all together, which is my vector x of pixels, would be basically generate one given the previous ones, in this case, zero. One given the previous one. One given the two previous ones. And so on and so on would be looking backwards to generate the current pixel again and again. And our formulation would be that all the pixels all together form the final stream of data. So how can we deal with this model? I think. Um, You've already seen something that models highly nonlinear and long range correlations sequentially. So, what model comes up to your mind? Is there any suggestion here? 
we're talking about deep learning, so a sort of neural net that can process this, respecting the, the, the time dependency, looking backwards. Is there any suggestion? Sorry? Yeah, okay. Exactly. So that's a first possible solution, okay? Or recurrent neural net. So it does recursive uh, operations, but yes, exactly. So that's the first model that was made called Pixel RNN, and it was specifically made to generate images. So uh, they modeled it just with, just with let's say, uh, with an RNN. Uh, many layers of RNNs and a specific sort of architecture, but I'm not getting into the details of the architecture. It's just to depict how uh, easily they decompose the chain rule to just pixel by pixel scanning it in a raster order, row by row, the full image. So at every pixel they predict, let's say this is a grayscale image, the probability distribution with a softmax classifier, and that's it. So that's giving us the probability of the current pixel being a certain value. And in the end of the image, you get the global probability, so the product of all the subsets of probabilities. So your loss is the log loss. The summation of the logarithm of the individual probabilities is the general one, so for the full image. So a simple RNN making this out of regressive behavior, looking at the past, it's remembering, and remember the operation where this is the recursive element that's just remembering to generate sample by sample. But there could be another solution. And I just want here to show how it's not just about, so the versatile behavior of RNNs and CNNs for different tasks. Because probably, uh, I don't know if you can depict that RNNs are not just struggle, uh, struggling with sequences or CNNs are not just struggling with images. We can basically play with both if we understand the architectures and how they work underneath. So what's Pixel CNN, because I, I propose a convolutional neural net to solve this as well. Maybe you haven't seen this, but Winona hasn't either. So uh, the thing is, now imagine I will place it simple with 1D sequences. And I just want to depict how we can interchange these two architectures to do the same sort of generative thing. We will have the words as vectors and a sequence of length eight, so the eight vectors will be all together. It could be words, it could be pixels in the image involved, anything. In this case, we just have eight elements. So the typical convolution you've seen is just that we'll have a kernel in a certain convolutional layer, and we will have, in this case, it's just one kernel with, uh, that's basically looking at all the dimensions for every pixel. In this case, if we have a grayscale image, it would be a sequence of length eight pixels, so maybe a two times four image and then uh, one scalar value, so just this row uh, per, per pixel. And then the kernel will be just one row as well. But uh, what happens with the convolutions is that it's basically uh, sliding through our data, as you know. And you've seen it probably in two dimensions, which is the typical thing of the convolutional nets with three times three kernels and things like that. But can we... This is how it would work, sliding, and because we don't have padding, that you've seen that sometimes we just pad the borders to respect the output size to be the same as the input size, we would get this output, where one, two, and three combine give us one sample in the output, two, three, and four give us two, and so on. But what if I put the padding? Basically, I get the same length in the output. But what if I want to process sequential data? I can enforce my convolutions to be causal, I can causalize them, and the trick is quite simple. I just put in one of the sides, so the left side, such that I ensure that my first sample is just depending on my first sample or the past, which is zero. Second sample is just depending on second and first, and so on. So if we make these kernels, the convolutional kernel, large enough, we can have a receptive field, that's called, so every element here, this has a receptive field of size three. It sees three inputs. So if we make it large enough, it can emulate the behavior of an RNN. And this is the idea of the pixel CNN. It's basically about emulating the behavior of an RNN with a CNN, and you may wonder why. Why? It's just that here I'm depicting one kernel, but in, in practice we have k kernels, let's say, for a layer, right? Like 100, 500, I don't know, 20. It's a, de a design choice, as you may know. But uh, as long as the, the, what, what we can do 
is we can parallelize the computation of every of these kernels with our sequences to get all the operations in the output at the same time. Plus, we can control better how this memory uh, reaches our past or not, because we can control the span of these kernels, whereas with the recurrent nets, we can just place the gates and hope for the best, let's say, which is not maybe the best correct way to say it, but in this case, you for certainly know that this sample is looking at maybe 3,000 samples previously, although your kernel would be quite large, because it would be 1,000. So um, this is how pixel CNN works. And to depict it and to end with this sort of modeling, we will see how WaveNet works, which is the same principle as we've seen here, but maybe in this case, WaveNet uh, was made for audio purposes, so it's a one-dimensional signal already, so we don't have to worry about unrolling. And the thing is that we're also conditioning on the previous one, so the formulations is the same, and we will have a span of T samples to generate. The thing is that they wanted to model it with convolutions, basically for speed purposes and uh, for more efficient training, basically. And also for the memory purposes that I'm telling you, because one second of audio at 16 kilohertz sampling is 16,000 samples. So I want to look maybe at half a second, which is 8,000 samples to bring the next sample. Audio depends on a large span backwards. So you would have to consume these 8,000 samples, and RNN is not behaving well for more than 100 samples. So it can't, it can't reach normally more than 100 maybe, a regular RNN, even an LSTM, although it has its gates in practice. So the thing is that here, as I've said, you can force your receptive field, but you would have to stack many, many layers or put many, many parameters, because every of, here it's two, but if it's three or four or five, I'm augmenting the size of my kernels. And that's multiplied by the number of kernels in every layer. How can I do it with a simple trick? You've already seen it. I think, which is called basically dilation in the convolutions. It's just spacing somehow with zeros. And basically every layer is exponentially increasing this spacing such that my receptive field in the last unit is seeing more and more and more span with the same amount of layers. Okay? And this is how the state of the art in generative modeling for, um, for speech synthesis, for example, or even for images works. It's the same, it's just a sequential process uh, that's working with the chain rule of probability, predicting classes, something that you've seen. It's just a classification time step by time step. So, yeah. Can we make it learn natural distribution and perform a specific task condition on it? Yes, of course, it's just as if we can also condition such that it's not just generating x, but it's generating x given an h. And I want to go to the WaveNet example here, because here we'll see some samples of what happens when I'm just generating natural distribution. I think there's audio, right, Xavi? Isn't there? <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Avocado is a pear shape. Yeah, okay. So now. It was a test HAI. still zero but not the teacher did the fact that I got to the school. I'm pretty close. Nothing. I just evened. There was this. There's a lot of work for Caden to be challenged. But as an A, because I had Jeff over it. It's her over to tell you to be this an art, are they? But I can hear what I'm. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. That's it. So this is the way in which either we learn the natural distribution of X by, in this case, a recursive in an autoregressive way, it will just generate what X looks like in the nature, but we can guide it to say what we want to say, basically, and this is when we condition with H, which is basically a compressed embedding of the textual input somehow, okay? So this is just to depict that the conditional WaveNet is how we can make a speech synthesis work, or we can say that we want to generate a dog in the picture and we would place some sort of encoding H 
a vector that's summarizing that we want to generate a doc. So it would be auto-recursively conditioning the generator, the generation process of X into H. So the thing is, it produces very sharp and realistic samples. It's quite interesting. You've heard some speech generated by a machine by just exploiting the underlying structure of how speech is generating with a probabilistic model. Uh, that's basically very certain about how is the distribution. So it sounds really natural. But is this, uh, is this cheap computationally? What do you think? This sort of autoregressive model. What if I want to generate one second of speech? I'm saying that maybe in that convolution net here, it's just depicting three layers to reach maybe it's 16 samples, I haven't counted. But the thing is, what if I want to reach 8,000, as I've said before, maybe I need 30 layers. 30 layers are regressing one by one. Even when it is an RNN or a CNN, it means 16,000 inferences to 30 layers to just have one second of speech in this case. So the first wave net was in a good, in a good powered machine, let's say, not with GPU, because GPU does nothing here. It's just recursively predicting. You don't parallelize anything in synthesis time. But there, in that sort of machine, two minutes to generate just one second of signal. So this is quite expensive uh, in terms of generation. But very effective modeling. Can we go farther and try to model something like a one-shot generator by changing the way in which we model the distribution. It won't be with the chain rule, because the chain rule has this limitation of, of having to predict one by one, which turns it to be really slow. But we can switch to the next models, which are variational encoders and or generative adversarial networks. Both we will, will predict the data in the same sort of way, which is with one-shot generations. Well, we can make it with some sequential components. But the very basic idea is, uh, as Xavi said, I'm presenting you first what the autoencoder is, which is what you've, you've seen that I have some X and some bottleneck here, which is generating some hidden codes, C, which are the deterministic vectors. X gets mapped into C, and then it gets reconstructed back, back into X with hat, which has some inherent error, of course, because uh, it, won't, it won't normally be a perfect reconstruction. But uh, what generative thing can I do with it? Can I make it generate new data? What do you think? How could I make it, let's say, train to know what, that the input is, uh, is regenerating the output? So it's generating stuff. But a generative model, as I've said, has a very, very important characteristic, which is it's, it, it doesn't have to memorize, right? So is this able to generate new stuff? No. Because this is deterministically mapping my inputs to C codes. I can store the codes, maybe. I could store that this cat is the code, I don't know, 001, and that a dog would be 010. I would have just three codes then, so really a poor model. But the thing is that uh, I could have this mapping in a lookup table, but this wouldn't be a generative model, because I'm requiring my generative model to know to generate new samples that have, have not been seen during training. So this is why this is not a generative model at all. This is just a way to represent our data in a lower dimensional space, maybe, or to pre-train the weights, as Chavi said, for these communicative approaches, etc. But as it has just pure memorization, uh, Winona doesn't like it in this case. The thing is, we'll move forward to restrict this shared space into what we call the latent representation. So these are some hidden features that are following a probability distribution that simplify our real probability distribution. So as we want to generate X pictures of cats or whatever, we're mapping the characteristics of what generates pictures of cats or dogs or whatever we're presenting into Z, which is a lower dimensional distribution that's factorizing our knowledge about that real world that's so complicated. And we're going to restrict what we learn here to be a random variable, something probabilistic, from where we can sample after training. So we can just withdraw the first process of training, and then we can sample now from our latent vector to get new images. This is a generative model. This has to generate new stuff that has not been seen, but respecting how cats look like. So. She likes it now. Um, 
the thing is that I'm first presenting you what the graphical, this is called a graphical model, and it's normally used to denote um, in Bayesian networks, it's used to denote how many random variables or variables uh, interact with each other. So this is what a uh, variant short encoder is in this schematic. What it means is we'll have some fixed parameters that are our model parameters, our machine learning model parameters, and then some samples from our simpler distribution. And then we will have to generate x, and we can generate it n times, so as many times as we want, whilst fixed parameters, so the network will remain the same once it's trained, but it will have learned that from some prior distribution z, we can sample from a normal distribution, for example, and get different cats or different dogs or different sort of images that we want. So we are learning this mapping function that goes from the random, the random sample z and the fixed parameter theta, which turns out to be a random variable x. Basically, this is the randomness in our model, controlled by our latent space. So we want a way to learn to condense our real data into that latent space. And we can even maybe uh, explore how the latent space is, is to basically capture characteristics of our data. But that's something that I will talk about with GANs, but the same applies with variational encoders. Think that I'm condensing my information into Z. And the thing is that I want my model to learn P of X. So this is the, ma the maximum likelihood uh, principle that applies. That's basically playing with having some prior P of Z, and I can apply it. Uh, with that, I can reconstruct P of X. Um, so why uh, this is the principle by which I can simplify my real distribution. Let's say I would have a distribution in the, in the ring. And with Z being a simpler thing, I could nonlinear map things to get into a more complex distribution that I, should, I, I, I wouldn't have to model, let's say. Uh, the thing is that we know a really, really good nonlinear mapper, which is the neural net. So variational autoencoders are the foundation or the collision between the Bayesian modeling that I've shown, playing with this modeling the posteriors from the priors, and the neural nets because of their nonlinear powerful mapping capabilities. So they can turn the Gaussian into a ring or into a dog. So uh, now move on to say we want to solve this maximum likelihood problem. And here we'll have a few math, um, especially coming from information theory. But I'll make it smooth just to show that, that we have an autoencoder-like architecture. But there is a meaningful process overall for the whole architecture that has mathematical reasoning behind from a Bayesian theory, that's called variational inference. That's not something that we're talking about, but variational inference is just as a key idea about having to model a distribution that's very complicated, cumbersome, that we want, don't want to model with an approximated one. So we turn our modeling of a complex distribution into an optimization problem where we find some distribution that's similar enough from where we can sample and get realistic enough samples. That's variational inference, not sampling from the real distribution, but approximating one to something that's fair enough, let's say. So we will have that we want P of X and Z, and P of Z, that's what we want. And we introduced that, that that's the key piece, P of Z given X. So see that uh, I, would, I would have a latent space that's basically governed by this P of Z shape, but I want to model actually P of Z given X because uh, not my excess, my data, doesn't have a representation for all the Zs in the world. Probably many Zs don't have probability mass. So what I want is first having the subset of Zs that have meaningful capturing, capturing meaningfully, let's say, my data characteristics. So those are P of Z given Xs. So I will first condense my information into that condition distribution, not the full set of Zs. And then I will be able to recover back to the X space once the Z has a meaning relation, related to my real data, OK? Does that make sense to you? So uh, well, I have the, the, the draw in the next sample. But as P of Z given X, that's the real subset of Zs. Let me say it this way first, and then show you the schematic in the next slide. So as P of Z given X is very complicated, it's the real one, the real distribution. I want to approximate it with a Q of Z given X that will be the fair enough distribution, let's say. But the distribution that's condensing our real information 
into that lower space that will make sense from where we will sample and recover realistic samples. Okay? So this begins to shape up as an encoder-decoder setup where something is first condensing. I have this pointer. Something is first condensing my information into Q of Z given X. That's quite, quite close to the real one in the Bayesian formulation. And then I will be able to recover my X's given Z's. So first, I have some sort of encoder with its parameters theta that will go from x's to z's that will model this q of z given x. And then I will have a decoder that's reconstructing back my data. So plausible predictions, x hats, are not the exact thing as x's. This is a probabilistic approach. We're not having a deterministic mapping. But I'm just basically mapping my data over a manifold, that's what Xavi said, a lower dimensional manifold that distribu that's distributed. As I say it is distributed, it will be a Gaussian distribution, so on the surface of that Gaussian I will be mapping the points, such that every dimension of my manifold will have a meaningful, th a meaningful characteristic like, if I've shown it like tons of cats and dogs, it will learn, well, let's say just cats. Uh, it's simple in this case because I can say what can we learn from the cat? It has ears, which is the type of the ears. It has fur, so either it is long or short. It has a color, it has a pose, there's lighting in the image, there's a size for the cat. So all these sort of things will get encoded without my control. It's some sort of, um, I'm explicitly saying that it has to be over the Gaussian, but I'm not saying how. And I'm enforcing the reconstruction to be fair enough. So my Q will represent that mapping in a good quality enough such that I can reconstruct plausible samples, but will not be the exact distribution. So there will be a lower bound in the end of the day. End of the day. And here I begin with the math, um, which is fundamental in the KL divergence distance. This is uh, from information theory. How many people know the KL divergence? Almost all of you, I guess. Okay, it's just a measure of distance between two probability distributions. Uh, the thing is that uh, this comes from this information theory background where we want to compare uh, what gets into a destination by modeling the channel probabilistically, things like that. So the thing is that I said that I have Q of Z given X and P of Z given X, and this is my approximation distribution. What happens is that I can measure the distance between my approximation and the real distribution. So uh, by computing the KL distance, I get to this formulation. What I have that that distance is this expectation between the difference of the log uh, probabilities. So the thing is, I can keep operating with this, now applying the base rule, to basically place my real objective, which is modeling P of x, into the equation. So don't lose the, the, the main objective here is to model P of x in the end of the day. Okay? This likelihood that I was uh, depicting here. So I'm depending on these parameters, but I'm introducing a subspace of, it, of Zs where I'm mapping my data to reconstruct them plausible solutions to, reconstruct, to, to learn the nature of my data. So here I want to introduce P of x again, just to know which is the equation I have to optimize to learn uh, properly my full architecture between encoder and decoder. Uh, how to restrict that Z learning that before it was deterministic and now is random. The thing is that by applying the base rule, I can keep operating and say, uh, I'm making this decomposition where I introduce the base rule. So um, if I keep operating a bit by moving play from to the other side of the equality and playing around with the signs, uh, I finally get to this formulation simplified where that KL divergence equals to the uh, these differences where I have this, this is my encoder output, this is my decoder output, this is my prior distribution, which I will decide how it is, but this is my total distribution, so the distribution of my data in the end of the day. And it doesn't depend on Z, so I can get it out of the expectation, which turns out to leave me with this result with which I can play around and say now, my distance between the approximation and the true distribution minus the log probability of my true data is basically this difference between um, 
well, let me rearrange the terms because it doesn't make sense to find the explanation here, but to find the final resolution, which is operating a bit with the signs and stuff, we will reach that. This uh, KL divergence between, so the error bound, let's say, the error that there is always between my approximation and the real distribution I wanted to model with the encoder, and minus my log probability of the real data, or in this case I swap the changes, so the signs, so the log probability of my data minus that lower bound, that's a constant error I cannot avoid, because that's the approximation function towards the real one, equals to this reconstruction loss of my decoder network minus the KL divergence of my encoder network with some prior distribution I will choose. This is the final formulation of what variation autoencoders are about. So I know I've been playing around uh, quite quickly with these uh, lots of formulas that in the end of the day turn out to summarize into this simple idea of my distribution of my, the distribution of my data, let me point it out like this because it's simpler, the distribution of my data minus some error that I will always commit because I'm just approximating my encoded distribution to something that's the real one but I will never reach that equals a reconstruction loss of the decoder of my network minus this regularization term that we will call. These two terms are called allow, um, the lower bound of the variational inference. And these two terms are the, one we're the ones we're playing around to basically obtain a better estimation of our log of P of X. We know that uh, um, this KL divergence term is strictly positive. So the thing is that when we play, this remains constant, is something we cannot avoid, but this is the thing we optimize to reach a good representation within our autoencoder to map our data to Z, and to a Z that represents as good as possible our data and then reconstruct back some solutions. So this is how the equation looks like in the end of the day, okay? We want to maximize this. We want to maximize this. So the thing is that we maximize this part of the equation. We know this is strictly positive. So this is what we work with, and our loss function is about maximizing a reconstruction loss, so minimizing reconstruction loss, maximizing the likelihood of our reconstruction data, and basically um, playing with this regularization term for which we decide how our manifold looks like. What I mean with this is, well, yeah, log likelihood of our data, not computable and always there. It will be our approximation error, reconstruction loss of our data given the latent space. So this is a loss in the output of our decoder. This is the regularization term that's basically controlling how our data gets mapped onto a manifold with a certain shape. And this is controlling that our data lays over that manifold. So this term is basically enforcing that whatever I'm mapping from my input gets over the surface of the distribution I say. This is the term. Whilst this one is controlling how good samples are reconstructed. So how realistic they look, images. So uh, just to tell you that what's the simplest thing we can do to impose, to calculate this KL divergence, I have these two distributions here. So I have to decide which is the shape of my manifold now. I've said it would be Gaussian, it is Gaussian. This will be the prior distribution is a normal distribution. So it's basically Gaussian distribution of mean zero and variance one. The thing is that here, I decide my uh, output of the encoder to be a Gaussian distribution as well that will get close to that normal distribution, so to that of my prior. So what I will have is that my output, the encoder network, will predict not just codes, not just vector C, but it will predict a mean and a standard deviation, okay? A vector of means and a vector of standard deviations of dimensionality to dimension of my Gaussian. And then uh, that will be used to enforce that this distribution, this mean and standard deviation, look like a Gaussian centered in the mean zero and standard deviation one. And I'll tell you why in few slides, because that's the ending, um, why we want to enforce it to lay in the, standard in the mean zero in standard deviation one, so in our prior distribution. This is what we do. The previous KL is now basically parameterized, as we've said, with the Gaussians, the one we predict, and the one we enforce the prediction to go to, and the KL divergence gets analytically, basically. So this is part of our loss function. This is basically the regularization term of our loss function.
So now we'll have to, to wrap up all these mathematics, get summarized into our encoder, the image gets projected into a mean and a variance, and that's basically giving us a sample from a normal distribution that has this mean invariance. That's the vector z. And we perform this distance operation during training to approach our z's to z sampled from the normal distribution of mean 0 and standard deviation 1. So to our prior, we want our q distribution to be close to p of z. And then we reconstruct back by doing this operation, which can be just mean square error. For example, if we have images, these are real valued pixels. So we reconstruct the real valued pixels with a mean square error, for example. Or if it's binary data, like in MNIST, we have black and white. We can have a binary cross-entropy that you might have used. Or the loss of our choice to just reconstruct whatever comes out of the network with the real data. But the thing is, there's a one last detail here. And this is one of the things why we choose a Gaussian distribution. You have to keep in mind, very important for the variation of encoders. I'm training a neural net from end to end that I say. I have my input data and my output data. I'm having some losses. I'm back propagating the gradients. Things get corrected. And I have my generative model in the end of the day after enough iterations. It's just that I cannot back propagate gradients to this model. So here, my operation of sampling from that distribution. So I'm just predicting a mean and a standard deviation here. And I would sample from a program saying, give me a sample from a random Gaussian distribution centered at this mean and with this standard deviation. It would give me a sample. This operation is not, is not differentiable. The problem is that gradients would be cut here. So we cannot train the encoder, nor this latent space. We can just train the decoder. The thing is, how can we make it become differentiable really easy with something called wrapper mysterization trick? It's as simple as saying, as I can have a normal distribution centered at zero with standard deviation one, we can just sample from this, so always sample externally, not in the middle of the model cutting the flow, but externally we have some sample epsilon that we multiply by our sigma, sum up mi, which are mi or mu, however you call it, so in original Greece it's, it's mi, that's why I say mi. Uh, the thing is that uh, these operations are already differentiable, so my gradients flow now. Everything is differentiable and wonderful, so now my model is basically flowing the gradients from end to end, such that it's fully trainable. So my z becomes this, the product with epsilon and summing up me, which are the predictions of my encoder. Now everything is trained such that cats get mapped onto z's that lay close to Gaussian distributions, close to with mean zero and standard deviation one, and they get reconstructed back to be cats uh, probabilistically, such that after training, how can now, how can I now expect the generative behavior? That's like the last question. How would you now sample from this model new cats, new dogs? How would you now modify this such that now I get new cats, for example? What would you do? Any clue about it? I have now trained the model such that everything in the input got mapped into Zs. And I got rec I will be I've been reconstructing cuts along the way during training, so my model condensed information into Z. What would I do to generate new cuts? Any clue? Remember, I have this. Well, I can just get rid of the encoder and sample as many epsilons as I want, and then. I'll be generating hopefully cats because I've made my data lay close to this distribution such that it makes sense to sample from this prior to generate new samples from my P of X. Remember that I've condensed my really complex distribution P of X, given Z, into Z, into my prior space. That's what I've done. So if I sample from my prior space, I have to expect to have some samples that look like my original data. So, yeah? Okay. Come back to that. Okay. Perfect. So, the, the only thing is that, uh, well, I had some examples here on the, just to check finally that uh, what happens with this Z now? That I may have a 100 dimensional vector expected as the input here, so I can sample randomly from Z. Or I can basically be walking around different dimensions so I can interpolate 
in this distribution, dimension by dimension, and I can discover different patterns. So this is what happens, that every image is being interpolated with a different Z. So I'm just maybe walking in the region of the nines because they are captured in some dimension. So moving in that dimension, linearly interpolating, gives me new nines or eights or sevens or so on. So different positions, as you see, different strokes, this is not that very interesting, maybe, and faces look like more impressive. So the same happens with faces. A bunch of faces have been shown to the model, such that now, if I can walk around in certain dimensions, I can capture uh, that men, white men look like this, or mm, women look like that, or I don't know, depending on the gender, the, the pose, the lighting, and the age, anything. So uh, that's how. In the end of the day, my data got encoded into that simple distribution. You have some, if you're curious, it's really, really, really easy to define a variation of encoder like this in PyTorch, these few lines. And the loss is defined like this. It's the same mathematics as you've seen in the previous slides. So you have the example in this link. You can play around with it. And this is the first generative model that you've seen that's uh, not that costly because it's not autoregressive. Uh, but it doesn't generate the images as sharp as the next model we will see next day, which will be generative adversarial networks. And I'll go into why. So we'll see how they work and the difference between those and this and pixel CNNs. So next day we'll see generative adversarial networks.